Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, this is the final um, Caribbean uh, Studies seminar series of um, of the semester, and I'm absolutely delighted um, to welcome uh, Renee Landell, who is now Dr. Renee Landell, as she recently um, uh, she recently was awarded her um, her PhD. Um, Renee Landell is a creative practitioner at um, the Institute of Languages, Cultures and Societies, um, also known as ILKS. She recently um, wrote her thesis, which is looking at decolonial eco-critical approaches to Anglophone Caribbean neo-slave narratives. Now, alongside her research, Renee works as the founding director of Beyond Margins UK, a racial justice and equity movement, and she's also co-founder of Black in Arts and Humanities, a global online network of Black scholars and practitioners. Renee's a writer who's represented, been, uh, who is currently represented by the leading international literary agency, Andrew Nurnberg Associates, and she's appeared on Al Jazeera News, BBC News and CBS Canada. Um, you may have seen her more recently on the BBC Two documentary, David Harewood on Blackface as um, an on-screen historian. So um, without further ado, um, Renee, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you today, um, and please, over to you. Thank you so much, Eve, for that, that lovely warm introduction, and um, welcome everybody to this session. Thank you all so much for joining. It's so lovely to see some familiar names and some names that I don't know, so that's it's really encouraging, so thank you so much for joining. Um, firstly, I want to thank uh, the CLACS and the ILCS for um, supporting me in this project. I'm really excited to discuss this work today um, for several reasons, but the main reason being that this is the first in my academic career where I am talking beyond theory and thinking about literature as creative practice. And so this is a quite a monumental moment for me today to feels like a reintroduction um, of myself as an academic. And so I'm really excited to discuss this work. Let me share my screen and let's get straight in to the presentation. Okay, so the, the session for today is titled, I've titled it Writing, Reading, Sounding, Painting, Humans and Non-Humans in Caribbean neo slave Narratives. And I thought it would be good, a good way to start to kind of give you an overview of what you can expect in this talk today, um, what you can expect to hear and see. We are going to engage our senses and hopefully you join in with me here. Um, I'm going to be showing and we're going to be listening to things and, and really getting involved. So the talk will think across species in the context of slavery in the Caribbean to explore how such thinking can help to engage the, the historically embodied reality of being black in a shared oppressive world. And we say that we are all, as humans with non-humans, interconnected. And it is that interspecies engagement from a historical category of thought that has long interested me. And so the talk begins with a summary, with a summary of my PhD research, which explores how Anglophone Caribbean neo-slave narratives rewrite Black humanity and the non-human world against controlling anti-Black images. And this talk will examine how a decolonial eco-critical reading has revealed hidden histories of interspecies violence, as well as resistance during slavery in a distinctly Caribbean context. And reflecting on the ways I've sought to deepen and disrupt my own typical methods of engaging with neo-slave narratives, this talk examines how my thesis has evolved into visual and auditory art during my now completed residency role as a creative practitioner at the Institute of Languages, Cultures and Societies. I will reflect on my process and progress in creating two large scale visual art pieces, as well as soundscapes, as ways of animating my own literary analysis of two Caribbean neo-slave poems. And in doing so, I seek to highlight how a multi-sensory experience of Caribbean neo-slave narratives can provide a powerful tool for examining uh, the limitations and possibilities of written literature in representing the kind of intimacies and, and enigmas of embodied contact with our very complicated world. 
And so before I go any further, um, it's just to say that as I am talking, please do write questions. We're gonna have a Q and A towards the end and I would love to engage with all of your questions. But I, I next wanted to kind of give you an introduction to me. Some of you, as I said, know me and have heard about my research before, but many people do not know me as Renee the artist or Renee the musician. And I wanted to kind of reintroduce myself and introduce myself today. Okay, let's see if we can change that. Yeah, there we go. So uh, before my love of literature, which did start at a very early age, I was really passionate about art and I found myself really enjoying specifically portrait painting um, of you know certain people in my family or people in my community and that became a, a great way for me to kind of escape um, the kind of pressures and toils of being a young child which isn't many of course adulthood is way worse um, so yes art became a true passion for me and it became a way of escape, but also a, a way of engaging and figuring out who I am as a person and, and my own culture and my history. Um, and so this is why I have, as, I, as you can see in some of the images that are on the screen, the first one to the, the kind of top left of the screen is, a, is an image of my late grandfather, my granddad Cooper, um, who was, uh, a Jamaican who, who lived in the countryside. And this is a kind of younger image of him really capturing and that project when I was doing this project back in my A-levels back in the day um, was on aging. And so I've done two portraits of him. This one, as I said, in the corner and then the bottom center one is also him later on in age. And it was, cap it was capturing blackness and aging. Um, and that was a really, really fun pro project. And, in the top right corner is my auntie. In the bottom right corner is uh, my late bishop of our church organization, Bethel United Church of Jesus Christ Apostolic, um, the founding father of apostolic uh, Black Pentecostalism and Apostolicism in the UK. And so these portraits specifically mean a lot to me because they, they are all parts of my story and my becoming as Renee Landell and figuring out who I am in this kind of young, uh, in the in the kind of bottom left corner, you see a young girl, it's not so much me, but it's kind of the enemy or, or who I think the enemy was back then. I used to be very shy and not forthcoming. Um, and I wanted to try and capture that in, in pen drawing. And so moving on, not only have I had a very deep interest and love of art growing up, but also music, I am, one half of a gospel duet. I am a, an identical twin and we are called the Landau Twins. Um, we have done some incredible work. Um, there are images here with our band, images here when we were on tour, um, doing some large scale events. It sent that one, that image there in the, in the center is at Central Hall in London. Um, you've got images there of some of the albums and, and things that we have produced and Music has been a way to connect spiritually with, you know, um, in, uh, to kind of broaden and get a deeper sense of my faith and understanding of my faith. But it has also been, again, an escape. Uh, music I find can be very healing. It can be very comforting. It can be um, something as a form of relaxation. And, and again, that kind of level of escapism. And so I have always been a creative person and art has always been a central, uh, a centerpiece rather of my life uh, through you know painting and, and creating music and that kind of creative output to the world where others can engage visually or auditory um, with my work and, 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 and the, the, the kind of contributions that I've put out in, in these ways. And um, just to say, because I know my twin sister is on this call right now, <laughs> Hi, Rihanna. Um, yes, so we work together as the Landau Twins and um, we've been working on some projects. And um, yes, it's it's really good as well, even forms of bonding with my twin sister in this way and harmonizing with my twin sister. It has been a an alternative form of engaging and bonding. So that's a little bit about me and an idea of who I was before I became Renee, the academic of literary and cultural studies. 
But now I want to talk about how we get to literature and then we're going to combine everything together before I show some of my um, the work that I'm doing now. So literature and culture have have always fascinated me. I, as a young age, I, I loved reading um, a lot. And many times I would read narratives and, and unfortunately read about narratives that didn't center characters that I can identify with, histories and cultures that were not my own. Um, and me trying to find relatable points um, through alternative ways. And, you know, as I grew older, I, I knew very, very strongly that I wanted to go into literature and culture for university. And, and there I studied at, uh, at Royal Holloway University of London um, on a course called Comparative Literature and Culture, which was amazing because it allowed you to read literatures from across the world, uh, different cultures, different periods, different genres, in different languages and, and often in translation. Um, and that was amazing. But I found that there was something missing and there often is in uh, UK academia is that within the literary arena, there often are voices that are silenced or delegitimized in such a way where you will hear so much about Shakespeare and uh, Greek writers, but not so much about African and Caribbean or other writers of the black diaspora. Um, but what I love about literature is that it allows you to be immersed into new worlds through words. You gain uh, mental imaginations and there is this mental sensory overload that comes with reading, uh, imagining the smells, the tastes, the sights and the sounds of the literary world that the author creates without ever tangibly experiencing that world. And literary cultural studies through periods, genres, cultures, and languages, um, when I think about that as a subject, I believe that it is a great shame that African and Caribbean voices remain silenced or missing despite the huge global contribution that black writers across the diaspora have made to the literary arena. Writers such as Derek Walcott and Marlon James and uh, Andrea Levy and Dion Brand and Jamaica Kincaid and Selvon and Lamming and I can go on all day. These voices have been silenced, not to us, many of us here would most likely are in Caribbean studies, I presume. So maybe perhaps not to us, but really thinking about uh, uh, school level curriculum and languages and literatures at university as a module. And so it was my thinking and, and uh, my heart really kind of Resonate, resonated with the idea and joining the many scholars who are bringing out uh, the voices of African Caribbean writers out of the margins where it has long so often remains in academia. And beyond that, I've, I've also had a, a long interest in slavery studies, thinking much about my own history and what that can teach me about who I am and filling in the blanks that I have, I have often been left with. Um, and so here now we get to my PhD research and just to give an overview of the context of the literature, um, I specialize in neo-slave narratives, but I thought it would be best, uh, it would be important to start with an overview of what the slave narrative is. So the slave narrative is a genre of first-hand narratives that provide an in-depth view of the heinous nature of slavery from those who lived it. It is a genre of testimonies about the horror and the agony of everyday life for enslaved people who in their narrations and speaking in their voices address violence and resistance and survival. And such writings became powerful tools used by the abolitionist movement for evidence and motivation toward uh, the destruction uh, or the abolition of the institution of slavery. And some of the most significant texts of this tradition include the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, uh, incidents in the life of a slave girl written by uh, Harriet Jacobs and, and many more. You can see others on the screen right now. But as I said, I specialize in the neo-slave narrative. Neo-slave narratives are contemporary fictional accounts of slavery that uh, first emerged after the Second World War and proliferated in the, in the late 1960s and the 70s. You may be familiar with narratives such as The Color Purple or the Long Song. 
And the first study to define the neo-slave narrative is Bernard W. Bell's The Afro-American Novel and Its Tradition, which was published in 1987. And in this text, Bell explores how the neo-slave narrative departs from the autobiographical form of the traditional slave narrative by reorientating uh, individualist accounts of slavery to reimagine or imagine a collective and diverse story. And the neo-slave narrative also works to redress omissions of taboos in the traditional genre, taboos such as stories of rape and, and other uh, derivatives of sexual violence, as well as love and romance, they were also omitted because white editors believed that narratives, for instance, of love and romance would delegitimize the horror of slavery. And as I said, that their intention and their goal and objective was toward abolition. And so they thought including the very real stories of enslaved people falling in love or even falling in love with their enslaver would delegitimize the horror of that history. And furthermore, rape stories as well were also often omitted because historically there were no, at that time, there were no legal definitions for rape as a crime during this time. And so the neo save narrative redresses these omissions and includes these stories. Uh, and in doing so, it tells a more comprehensive narrative of slavery through fiction. And the fictitious quality, and it's important for me to say this before moving on, the fictitious quality of the neo-slave narrative does not make it subordinate to history or rather uh, subordinate to the autobiographic testimonies, nor does it minimize the voices of the enslaved. I would say that it is revisionary and it presents new representations to demonstrate the possibilities of literature when uh, sort of uncoupled from historical truth in that it provides the reader with alternative truths that amplify the voices of the subject and offer a necessary distance to feel empathy and to feel catharsis. And this makes the genre a useful tool for considering the multiple ways that literature uh, can write back against historical colonial myths. I'm gonna get um, more into that a little bit later, but. I also want to say that having made a case for artistic representation and the, you know, the sort of powerful possibilities of, of its relationship with history, I want to also point out that the earliest definitions of the neo-slave narrative strictly refer to the American plantation and the African-American experience, despite an existing tradition of Anglophone Caribbean neo-slave narratives in the form of novels and short stories and poems, little scholarly work has paid direct and substantial attention to the Caribbean neo-slave narrative. And Maria Lima explains that there is silence as it pertains to uh, the Anglophone Caribbean contributions to the neo-slave narrative genre because of an unwillingness of the academic establishment to come to terms with that part of British history, that kind of uh, Britain's involvement in these um, terrible histories. And that's why when we think of the school curriculum, we are not taught about slavery in the same way that young children are in America. And so I agree with critics such as Nicole Aljo and Elizabeth Beckers that the critical neglect of the Caribbean neo-slave narrative genre contributes to the silencing of diasporic Africans outside of America. And this neglect also upholds uh, the tradition of erasure concerning Britain's involvement in slavery in the Caribbean. So that's a little bit about the text that I read. Now I wanna come to my research, what I was writing on for my thesis. Uh, as demonstrated by the title of my PhD thesis, my research redefines the popular Jamaican proverb, we run things, things no run we which loosely translates in British English to, we can control our lives. Our lives and our lived experiences do not have to control us. And so this proverb's central meaning is that we can choose how we respond to our circumstances, our past traumas, our cultural histories in thought and behavior. It speaks of agency rather than what Julietta Singh would describe as an antithetical or violent call to dominate others. So in sum, the thesis title is a proverbial philosophy of self-control, or at least that's how I theorize it uh, in my work. And it retorts what black 
scholars such as Bell Hooks and Patricia Hill Collins call controlling anti-Black images. Examples of anti-Black images include the mammy stereotype. We're seeing some of these figures on the screen right now. The mammy stereotype, the sambo, the Jezebel stereotype, the mandingo. You may be more familiar with um, images such as the coon, um, for example. And these images have worked to depict Black people as lazy, as violent, seductive, docile, inferior, unhygienic, illiterate, and they find their origin in colonial racist and pro-slave apologist writings and were idealized through visual images and written colonial imaginations of how African people think and how uh, we behave to justify and operationalize oppressive practices. And the appellations of these pervasive historical anti-Black images have been popularized and remain predominantly within critical scholarship on racist representation, again, in an American context. Largely overlooked are how these images have become central to British history and art forms for the, for the sake of rationalizing slavery in the Caribbean. And though few studies and references exist, there is an urgent need to turn our attention to the geographical locale of the Caribbean to amend this scholarly gap. In his 1975 article, Stereotypes and Ethnic Relationships in the Caribbean, Anthony Lang addresses just how, just how vast this gap is. He argues that there has been no cross-cultural functional analysis of the etiology of ethnic images in the region of the Caribbean. And significant time has passed since Lang has made such a claim, but it remains true today in literary studies. And this is where my research has uh, kind of filled in that critical gap. So two years before embarking on my research, I queried, because I've heard this quite, quite often, that if it is true that human activity impacts ecosystems and that we are all interconnected, then I thought that there must be a relationship between the degradation of black humanity and the destruction or desecration of the non-human world. And I thought that possible answers can be found in the study of literary texts. And for me, the proverbial title of my thesis, We Run Things, Things No One We, encapsulates the activity of the research, which is to read neo-slave narratives as meaningful responses to wildly held um, racist assumptions, while arguing that in resistance, Caribbean writers demonstrate the premise of We Run Things by representing themselves, as well as the non-human world, against anti-Black images in their neo-slave narratives. And this is how we get on to the methodology of my work. Uh, to attend such an investigation, I decided to combine decolonial theory and eco-criticism as both emphasize the importance of considering multiple dimensions of power and oppression. Decolonial theory looks at the uh, historical and ongoing effects of colonization on indigenous peoples and cultures while eco-criticism focuses on the relationship between literature and the environment. So combining these two approaches uh, for me allows for a nuanced examination of how texts represent and marginalize both human and non-human entities. It encourages readers to question how certain groups of people and aspects of the environment are portrayed and valorized or even erased within literary works. And furthermore, my analysis reveals that uh, the ways in which colonial ideologies have influenced literary representations of the indigenous of indigenous African peoples, as well as the non-human world, is worthy of consideration. Okay, so now we get on to what we're really here to talk about today, which is the ILCS project that I have been working on. Um, to, you know, coming towards the end of writing my PhD thesis and um, still ongoing today. Um, the, the kind of title that I had proposed for this work is A Multi-Sensory Experience, Black Humanity and the Non-Human World in Two Caribbean Neo-Slave Poems. And I just wanted to discuss before showing this work and engaging with it, we're gonna engage with it in multi-sensory ways, to kind of just focus, uh, to kind of give you an idea of the aims of the project. So the project aims to transform 
two Caribbean neo-slave narrative poems into a multi-sensory experience using vocal and abstract sound, as well as textual visual art pieces. And going through the process of decoding and reassembling based on my own literary analysis and interpretation, the project reads representations of black humanity and the non-human world in the selected poems. The artistic elements work to inform our understanding of interspecies collaboration during slavery in new ways, but also more broadly engage our embodied, uh, embodied experience as living, breathing creatures profoundly embedded in a shared natural world. Uh, I have been creating two large scale visual art pieces and two sound clips alongside to, to, to pair alongside the original written form of the selected poems uh, through my perceptible interpretation. And I argue that this kind of triangular relationship between the text and the image and the sounds where each element is informed by the other is an attempt to encourage others to think about how we can indulge the sensory dimensions of our intellectual understanding of literature. Furthermore, I believe that a multi-sensory experience of specifically Caribbean neo-slave narratives can provide a, a powerful tool for examining the, the limitations and possibilities of written literature in representing the intimacies and, enigma, and enigmas, sorry, of embodied contact with our natural world. And so readings of the poems in Caribbean Creole languages have been layered with sounds and music, is what I'm currently working on, that reflect some of the distinct images in each poem. And the visual art is incorporated into the project to demonstrate how we can manipulate the written word by visually illustrating the mental images that are invoked. As the pieces work to engage the body, they intend to make the audience feel like an integral part of the art rather than passive observers quietly inspecting its content from a comfortable distance. We gain a creative license for the sake of interpre interpretation as readers, but also as part of an audience, considering that literary and cultural texts are themselves artifacts. And so ultimately this research project aims to encourage reflections on uh, the ways that we can deepen and disrupt how we engage with literature, or more specifically, how we come to understand blackness and the non-human world in Caribbean neo-slave narratives. So before going any further, I have put together um, sort of a, a compilation of videos of, 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 so that you can get an idea of my art project and, and the process of that. So we're gonna take, this, this should be about a minute long, we're just gonna take a minute of just, just watching this, kind of watching the process. Okay, so yes, very sped up, but I hope you get a sense of kind of the stages of drawing and uh, to painting. You even saw in one piece, which I'm gonna discuss in just a little while, where I was even sewing um, onto, the, onto the canvas. And so I have really been thinking about alternative pedagogies and alternative practices, alternative ways of engaging with literature. And just to give a bit of backstory, this really stemmed from a seminar that I taught uh, a few years ago, where I had a poem on a screen, but also I had it, I had sheets of paper on tables 
And I thought of the idea to have sheets of paper and, and pens so that they could draw their responses or engage in it in any way that, that they wanted. And at the end of that session, um, a student had come to me and really thanked me because they felt inclusive. They have certain uh, disabilities and they felt included because there were so many different sensory things that they could engage with and they felt at such a level. And I had to be honest and say that I actually wasn't even, it wasn't my main objective to think about uh, shamefully, to think about accessibility, but that conversation challenged me going forward to think about how we can be more inclusive in the classroom, how we can be more inclusive in our research practice, not, not just our pedagogical practice. And from there, I, this kind of idea of multi-sensory experiences of literature, not just thinking about uh, reading and listening, but thinking about engaging all of our senses, the sight, the smell, taste, and, and, and listening, uh, can enhance our understanding of literary works. And it was a really powerful kind of enlightening moment for me that I hope to take forward in, in my research. And I've been thinking about how decoding and interpreting literature using art-based responses, such as music and visual arts, poses important challenges to what it means to read and to have experimental engagements with the written word. I believe that an arts-based response builds methodologically on arts-based research and goes beyond merely reproducing texts to focus instead on doing, making, creating and performing literature as something alternative to uh, challenge conceptions of learning uh, knowledge and literacies. And really this is me rebelling against the academy of what it has, um, the limitations it puts on literature students to just read and to hear and to interpret and, and have mental visualizations and, and, and mental um, sensory experiences. I wanted to take it outside of that, um, the, the mental boundaries of how we engage with literature. I believe that our understanding of visual arts, which refers broadly to art forms such as painting and filmmaking, photography, drawing, sculpture, as well as, me uh, as, well as music, sorry, and, and other forms, um, can enrich and enlighten our understanding of, of literature. I believe that the pairing of specifically even poetry and painting, which is commonly known as ekphrasis, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is established in literary and art theory. And regardless of the position of poetry as one of the oldest literary genres, researchers have begun to acknowledge its interdisciplinary and multimodal character to enable a contemporary view of poetry in the age of digital media and visual media and even sound media. Poetry is often referred to as a, a flexible and dynamic and multimod uh, multimodal medium anyway. And so I think it is uh, very much in the best interest for those who do deal with poetry to explore how we can engage with it and present it in alternative ways. I believe also that arts-based responses can theorize and conceptualize poetry, uh, poetry and poetry pedagogy in new and engaging and interdisciplinary ways while still attuning to the curricular objectives of studying poetry or studying novels. And I think that's important to say also. Consequently, several scholars have recognized a need, have begun to recognize a need for changing traditional poetry teaching. Uh, Creeley argued that poetry pedagogy needs to challenge traditional notions of what constitutes as poetry. And so he called for a more radical and disruptive pedagogy for bringing poetry to the classroom. And similarly, um, dressmen are urged for in investigations that contribute to renewing and reinvigorating the place of poetry in education. And so I believe that arts-based approaches can contribute to conceptualizing new pedagogical practices beyond text-based literacies and that more than anything, painters and sculptors, uh, they use their art to convey messages and induce thought. And even thinking about how simple uh, paintings can convey messages at different levels, things are rarely precisely just what they seem. And I think that's what I want this project to really bring to the fore. Engaging learners to discern signs and possible meanings of art is a healthy way, I believe, to also discuss writing 
Um, I even think about symbolism. Symbolism is a literary device involving the usage of symbolic elements, which can be words or people or animals, locations or abstract ideas to represent something more profound than their literal meaning. Uh, take for instance, color symbolism in literature. Color symbolism in literature involves using colors to represent a different or, or a deeper meaning. So um, really taking us back to GCSE literature here for those who, who aren't um, literary uh, scholars, thinking about back in the day when they would say, well, what does red mean to you? What, what feelings does the color red evoke in your mind? And often we would say love or passion or even violence and devastation. Um, and so words have this way, their symbolic value has, it has this way of invoking images, even feelings, but engaging our senses, but really merely in education at a mental level. And I'm really interested in exploring, as I said, beyond that mental level. Some writers may even use a color palette to convey a mood or underscore themes of their work. For instance, pastel colors may imply dreaminess in a text, uh, while darker shades may symbolize mystery or foreboding. Human society in many different cultures imbues specific colors with a set of finite meanings, making color symbolism especially effective as a recognizable device in literature. I also think about the verb and the adjective and how they can dissolve and erect into something perceptive to the, to the human eye and ear. Uh, we now have brush strokes and sounds that, that are able to harmonize with the written word. And literary theory is a way to interpret a work of art. That's what I believe. And what I'm proposing today is that literary theory is a way to interpret a work of art just as much as art can be a way to interpret or reinterpret a work of literature. Um, I wanted to, before moving on, finally say that uh, there are further what we may call form problems, cases in which literary linguistic forms can be explained through forms of art and uh, artistic forms made comprehensible by literary stylistic expressions. In these ways, we can reimagine metaphor as abstract art. We can reimagine personification in literature as a surrealist painting or alliteration as sound echoes, colors as paint hues and the use of harsh consonants and rhythms in poetry as music. An arranged mixtures of colors on the palette is reflective of the logical and illogical constructions of sentences arranged in poems and novels. The colors that are left to be mixed on the canvas by the eye of the spectator is analogous, in my, it, it, what I'm arguing is analogous to literary works where uh, overstressed nouns and strong epithets have, been, have to be reduced and pale verbs have to be intensified by the reader's judgment. So now coming on finally to the work that I have been doing, starting first with um, the first painting, um, it really lends itself to uh, David Dabby Dean, who was a Guyanese poet, uh, 1984 collection entitled Slave Song. And I use this work in the fourth chapter of my PhD thesis to really kind of focus on the violent and explicit narrative of slavery in Guyana, particularly as it concerns the historical hypersexualization of black men on the plantation. And I argue in that chapter that the, the historical hypersexualization of black men um, from the point of slavery, uh, there is a, a deep connection of violent amalgamation uh, between that and the animalized and the animalized body and what we the kind of racialization of animals. So that's what I really focus on in that chapter. And to bring that all together, going back to, I hope you're following me here, going back to anti-black controlling images, I focused on the Mandingo stereotype. So according to Brandon J. Manning, white enslavers invented the image of the animalistic and hypersexual Mandingo as a derogatory depiction of the Mandinka peoples of West Africa, which includes places like Mali and, and Guinea and Senegal. The Mandingo stereotype later gained prominence in the Jim Crow era with the pornotropic portrayals of black men with large penises and muscled physiques, uh, tall stature and dark skin. And the car caricaturing of these physical features helped generate the interplay between disgust 
and desire that ultimately revealed the contradictions of the Mandingo stereotype. However, the assertion that enslaved African men were animalistic, um, hypersexual beasts parlayed perfectly into racist ideas of bestiality and primitivism and ultimately inferiority. As Mel Shen argues, African uh, slaves first bore the epistemological weight of animalization. And so we can even draw links between slave, or slave auction blocks um, and the display of meat or between lynching and the slaughtering of animals of which the histories of racialization and animalization are interwoven. And these similarities of utility and labor reinscribed the subordinated status, uh, status of racialized people and that of animals as well, both as beasts of burden. And what I try to do in my work is not to compare ills between the human and the non-human, because I believe that that is, you run the risk of repeating speciesist and violent uh, and, and violent stereotypes. But what I try to, to put forward is a reading together of these histories. Um, yes, so we can also think about some of the popular, the popular media that has been presented, novels like How Sleeps the Beasts or films like, films and novels like King Kong. Um, and you will find that there is a, a you know, a historical uh, a, a racist history within these narratives where you have a racialized beast uh, contrasted against this kind of white damsel in distress, parlaying, as I said, perfectly on the ideas of black men as, as beasts, as the uh, villain against uh, white women. And this is how we get, you know, the kind of theorizations of what we're seeing now with the uh, weaponization of victimhood um, by white women, specifically we're seeing this in America, what they're calling the weaponization of white tears, where they're used specifically against black men for false accusations because of the histories of animalization, hypersexualization, these allegations are legitimized. And so we can think about how the Mandingo stereotype was constructed as a psychological response to the violence of the white, even the, uh, even the white male enslaver as it deceived others into believing that black masculinity was the only form of masculinity which was inherently violent and hypersexual. And together, white female victimology and uh, hegemon hegemonic white masculinity shaped the image of the Mandingo and transformed the bodies of enslaved black men into animalistic beasts in desperate need of taming. As such, white violence, such as lynching, uh, genital mutilation and butt breaking and other violent derivatives became justifiable. So in the eponymous poem, and this is one of the poems that I use for my fourth chapter in my PhD thesis, in the eponymous poem entitled Slave Song, the narrator satirically addresses the enslaver, bidding him to go ahead and, well, let me actually read it. It says, whip me till me bleed, till me beg, Tell me how me Hannibal, African orangutan. Tell me how me cannibal, fit for slaughter, fit for hang. So the poem exposes, instead of repeats, what Claire Jean Kim calls the zoo logo racial order, an order with which everything human depends upon uh, the perpetuation of the idea that the black human and the animal are unspeakably linked and worthy of being killed the torture of the black male narrator as punishment for his animalistic tendencies not only depicts the speciesist and, raci and racist colonial processes of dehumanization, but makes clear that a revaluation of animal life as whole is actually crucial for developing effective strategies for fighting the oppression of black men and of course, all black people. And it is the intertextual quality of Dave, uh, Dabby Dean's neo slave narrative that best reflects the motif of, of even brokenness that informs our understanding of how destructive and damaging the, Man, the Mandingo stereotype was. Um, just going forward, skipping a little bit down here. Um, so this is how we get to revealing kind of for the first time, the, the first painting that I have been working on 
thinking about everything that I have said, the kind of amalgamation of race and species here, thinking about the slaughterhouse and lynching, thinking about whipping and the slave auction block and how that animalization works. Of course, you'll see visual kind of reflections from the poem African Orangutan. There stood next to the enslaved man who is speaking and he is the narrator of this poem. And it's, it kind of relates to the idea that black masculinity is something that needs to be destroyed, something that is in, inherently violent, in, in, inherently violent enough that it needs, that there needs to be uh, this destruction. And so within this painting, I have thought very deeply about color. I thought very deeply about composition. Composition was really important here. Of course, this this kind of image doesn't quite make sense. In, in reality, you wouldn't have these objects specifically just falling with a kind of abstract background. So there is this sense of realism within the painting, but also some abstract ideas because I really wanted to kind of point out the absurdity of the racialization of animals as well as the animalization of uh, black humanity here. And you'll see um, in the in the right hand corner, the top right hand corner of the painting, that there is a rope, which I specifically felt to buy rope and and sew into the canvas, which was a a very long and arduous um, task. To have that element of touch, because I felt that this was really really important in thinking about the whip, in thinking about the slaughter tools, the uh, uh, tools that it was really important in this very visual painting to have an element of touch where you're feeling, um, because this is a very kind of visceral and uh, yeah, very visceral and violent poem, thinking about um, all of these violent ways of, um, uh, of taming the black, black body, taming the supposed inherent um, animality, taming the animal, taming the beast. And so I felt that that, that specifically with the noose was really, really important here. And we've got colors um, such as red, and I went with like a kind of a very dark green for the background, which almost looks black, um, to symbolize that the kind of death and destruction. And you've got blood there to kind of symbolize the, the violence. With the, the orangutan, I wanted the eyes to be very piercing. Hopefully um, this will all, this project will accumulate into an exhibition where you can see these pieces up close. But as you look into the eyes, there is this sense of deep sorrow coming from the animal, which I felt very, very necessary in, in thinking about this amalgamated history of emotion and feeling. Um, and that was something that I really, really wanted to bring, bring forth here, the emotion and not just the enslaved man, but also the animal to think across um, species and to think about interspecies violence and, and and in the in the next painting we'll think about more about interspecies resistance but this is kind of an introduction to this this first painting and here I've just got some so I I, I don't have an art studio so I have very much set up have my setup in my parents' kitchen, which they're, they're not very happy about. But um, <laughs> just some images of the process of drawing and going through, thinking about colour, thinking about how best to bring out this emotion, which, which I've already, much of which I've already spoken about. Again, some close-ups here. You've got uh, the bleeding on the chest. You've got the, the slaughter tools, the eyes, which I mentioned, where they're, they're, they're almost watery, enough for you to feel empathy and catharsis. Um, and there again, a close up of the, the rope, the, the, the noose, to get a sense of that kind of 3D uh, touch um, element. And now moving on to the second piece, wrapping up very soon, I'm very conscious of the time. Um, with the second piece, I focused on my first chapter of my PhD thesis, which looked at Grace Nichols, who again is a Guyanese poet, uh, her 1983 neo slave narrative poetry collection, I is a long memoried woman. Um, and just to give a little bit of kind of context of, of that, it, it is a, a haunting collection of poems that offer a chronology of slavery in the voice of an unnamed African woman. As a distinguishing characteristic of the Caribbean neo slave narrative, the narrator describes life pre and during slavery. She recounts memories of Africa, her arrival into the new world, of, of rape, of infanticide, which is the 
uh, the killing of one's own child and other clandestine or hidden acts of resistance. And within this um, chapter, I look at the mammy stereotype, um, thinking about motherhood, but also mother, the concept of mother Africa. And I look at them together, thinking about mother nature and, and those elements as well. So the mammy stereotype, just to give a quick overview, Barbara Christian described the mammy as being fat with enormous breasts that are full enough to nourish all the children in the world, but also sexless for she is ugly. Uh, according to what, you know, uh, this was the kind of stereotype. In popular culture, the mammy is often visually depicted as being dark and overweight with facial features that are typically pronounced as unattractive when held against the European kind of global standard of beauty. And the emphasis on these physical traits protected the myth that white men did not find black women attractive, which further concealed rampant sexual violence on the plantation. However, while the mammy was, you know, uh, projected as the undesirable foil, uh, she possessed traits of an idealized caregiver. She was amiable, non-threatening, submissive and obedient. She had an innate devotion specifically to white children on the plantation in ways that was assumed, in ways that never appeared natural with her own biological black children. Legitimizing claims of the bad biological black mother. Um, and this, you know, kind of lend, lended perfectly into uh, or legitimized perfectly the forced separation of the enslaved mother and her child on the plantation, which meant that ownership supplanted biology. Black women as property of their enslavers were denied access to biological motherhood and their bodies were turned into feeding machines and their children were forced to navigate slavery in their infancy as though they were adults. And the image of the bad black mother or, or the mammy and its uh, corollary of unusually self-sufficient black children is coupled with this always smiling mammy. Some of these images may uh, be familiar with you in, in America, Aunt Jemima's pancake mix is, is, is a very popular um, consumer good. And on that, you will see images like this of a black woman in, in very domestic clothing, and she's always smiling, which kind of assumed the idea during slavery that black women, enslaved black women enjoyed, be, enjoyed their role on the plantation, that slavery was a good and benevolent system. Therefore, there was no need to abolish because black women felt that they they really fit in in this role on the plantation. And so in that chapter, I think about how the memories that Grace Nichols speaks of in her poetry collection allow us to reimagine the experiences of two types of mothers during slavery. One mother is material, um, the enslaved black woman, and the other is symbolic, her African motherland. However, critical scholarship on the neo-slave narrative, specifically the Caribbean neo-slave narrative, has failed to consider how writers of this genre imagine revisionary engagements between the two, between the mother and mother nature, or between the mother and mother Africa. But in Nichols' text, both figures are depicted as being violated. Both figures are depicted as being dislocated from their children. For example, uh, uh, colonial writings of Africa by uh, colonizers depict Africa as being something in, in, in desperate need of help from Europe. And you can even think about a kind of symbolic umbilical cord that connects Europe to Africa where it's draining the nourishments as a child would from its mother, draining the nourishments from Africa to feed Europe. And so that's the kind of uh, comparative element that I make and draw upon in, in that chapter. And so I, for the second painting, I focus on a poem called Skin Teeth, taken from the collection of Eyes Along Memory Woman. And let me just read it. It says, not every skin teeth is a smile, Massa. If you see me smiling when you pass, if you see me bending when you ask, know that I smile, know that I bend, only the better to rise and strike again. In the Caribbean, specifically Jamaica, the term skin teeth re uh, refers to a grimace, 
Sometimes it can be threatening, sometimes it's cheeky, but it's not the same as just a smile. And so for this painting, I when I imagined this painting and I thought about it visually in my mind, I thought about this woman in the cane piece, in the cane field, uh, you see that she is staring at the viewer. And I've, I've painted her in such a way that even as you move across the painting, that her eyes will follow you. And she's staring at the, at the viewer because she wants to draw our attention here to what is going on specifically in the background. As you can see, I haven't finished this painting. I'm still working on it. Um, and in the background, there is this very wild uprising. There is this rebellion going on where the enslaved community are rising up against the, the enslaver. And you see the enslaver there on his horse. And in the background, there is the great house. And in the distance, there are, there are other plantations. You can't, you kind of have to imagine that. But she is there as all of this is going on, because as I said, the mammy is supposed to be unassuming, obedient, um, submissive. And during slavery, it was the case that many enslaved people often performed in their roles. So enslaved uh, women, specifically domestic workers in the house, they often performed in their roles as mammy, being appearing to be the best um, enslaved person, appearing to be so obedient and happy and, and engaged and willing to do the work, whilst uh, in, in ways that kind of um, uh, concealed their secret plotting with other enslaved people of a violent uprising. And in this way, the white enslaver was often left unsuspecting that this was even ever gonna happen. And so with her at the forefront of this painting, looking at the viewer, her smile, her, her mouth almost smiling in, in a way that she's it's almost a grimace, almost cheeky, um, we get this sense that everything that has been accumulating in her mind behind the smile is now taking place. And that's why I painted her using colors such as uh, bright yellow and, and uh, yellow ochre, because yellow often, especially even in literature, symbolizes hope. It symbolizes uh, even victory. And I really wanted to come that to come across. And the yellow really works here to contrast the deep dark red and the purple of the sky, where there is uh, violence taking place, but for the sake of resistance. Again, some close-ups here, you can see the eyes. Um, as I said, I've painted them in such a way that the eyes follow you. But I've, as you can see, I hope you can see this clearly, that I have embedded some of that yellow into the eyes. And so that there is a hope in her vision, the kind of forward uh, foreboding kind of uh, uh, thoughts in her mind about the end goal of this rebellion. And oftentimes enslaved people didn't, didn't know, you know, if their uprising was going to be successful. Many rebellions in the Caribbean weren't successful. And of course, you have some very successful ones and, you know, Haiti and, and those places. But there is still this hope which is brought out by the, the yellow and the yellow ochre paint. Um, and very briefly, and this is going to be brief because this is the part of the project which I have just started in the last few weeks. I've been thinking also about sound and the concepts of sound. So we're just going to listen to this for the next 30 seconds or so. So I've been capturing some unnatural sounds, as you see, to create this kind of tropical rainfall of the Caribbean and to think about the kind of the, the, the soundscapes of the landscape of the Caribbean, to think, to create an environment to accompany these paintings that can immerse you into that, that time period, that geography, that landscape. And I think it's really, really important. I've been speaking to people and, and describing landscapes and a lot of people have been unaware what a landscape, a uh, soundscape, sorry, is. And so the concept of, of soundscapes was popularized by Raymond Murray Schaefer, a Canadian composer and environmentalist, which is very important. He founded the, the World Sound, Soundscape Project at Simon Fraser University in the 1960s, which launched the modern study of acoustic ecology. 
Studying the relationship between humans and their environment through sound can take on many forms, whether in music, in noise pollution or other environmental efforts. And I've been thinking about the work of cultural ecologist David Abram, and he suggests that sensory experience is an inherently animist. And animism comes from this kind of ancient idea that uh, uh, kind of inanimate objects are can be animated in, in spirit um, through sound and, and, and other visual other visual elements. For centuries, the intonations, tempo, emphasis, tone, mood, and silences that augment the spoken word in forms such as song tales and folk tales and fables, even rituals and proverbs and prayer, as well as poetry, have indeed animated our perception of and encounters with other beings. Behind the narration of these oral forms lies memory, sometimes even prophecy, where time and materiality are subject to narrative treatment, particularly in Africa, and this is kind of relates to the context, the geographical and cultural context of my work, particularly in Africa, orality as an ancestral practice continues to be hailed as a significant method of transmitting and preserving the indigenous history and traditions and customs of people across the continent. Such orality has provided insight into the spiritual, creative and intimate engagements of African people with other beings, i.e. non-human beings, but also supernatural beings before the colonial intrusion of Europeans. And although orality remained a central facet of African identity during the enslavement of African peoples in the Caribbean, its function altered distinctly. Songs and storytelling and chants and rituals often calling for human and non-human or more than human, i.e. superhuman collaboration became a pertinent method of transmitting coded uh, subliminal messages for the sake of survival and resistance. This was crucial as writing systems have long been regarded as a superior and more intelligent form of communication in the Western world since the prehistoric age, which meant that enslaved African people's repurposing of oral traditions for the sake of resistance was subverse, uh, subversive and efficacious. Um, you wouldn't find, uh, many of you may be aware that during slavery, a lot of enslaved African people would sing songs, they would write songs like Amazing Grace or Swing Low Sweet Chariot that would have an alternative meaning, a coded meaning to leave the enslaver unassuming that what they were really trying to do was escape, to flee, to run away from the plantation or to stage an uprising. And it is through the rhythmic beats beating of the song, the lyrics that enabled this resistance. You can even think about the, the practice of drumming during slavery uh, to the white enslaver that just felt like a way of passing time. But for in, the enslaved community, drumming almost became a Morse code, a new language to communicate uh, a proposition of escape, a proposition of resistance. Renee, it pains me so much to ask you to wrap up right now. I'm right near the end. It's phenomenal. So but we do need to leave some time for questions. And I know there's a lot of questions that people want to ask. Yes, I am. I am right near the end. Um, so our understanding. Coming to the end. This was just some natural sounds that I captured to kind of also accompany. But coming to the end. Oh, there we go. Our understanding of visual and auditory art as it refers broadly to art forms, as I said, such as uh, painting and sculpture and music and prayer. The pairing specifically of poetry and, and painting, um, also known as acrophasis, as I said, is established in literary and art theory. But there needs to be more engagement with arts-based responses and how they can theorize and conceptualize poetry and novels and even plays, engaging and uh, engaging new and interdisciplinary ways uh, while still attuning to the curricular objectives of poetry education. So thank you all so much um, for, for bearing with me and listening to this talk today. I hope you learned something about new ways to engage with literature and I hope we can stay connected. There is my email and I speak most prominently about my work on Twitter. So do feel free to follow me there. Thank you all so much.
I will stop sharing. Thank you so much. There's, there is literally nothing that I can say um, or contribute at this juncture because that was just an absolutely phenomenal presentation. Um, and I think could we just all kind of um, switch on our cameras and just um, give a round of applause to, to Renee for that just just breathtaking um, talk. Um, thank you so, so much. Thank you. Just a round of appreciation for, from everybody. Um, I'm going to pass over the um, the Q and A to uh, to my colleague uh, Joseph, who's who's going to um, yeah lead that session. Um, I think I think the one thing that I did want to say before I have to be have to run off for childcare responsibilities is um, that what really resonated with with everything basically that you presented today was the um, announcement um, recently about the closure of the languages department at the University of Aberdeen. And I think what what just thinking about everything that you've said about the richness of literature and visual arts and culture and history and ensuring that narratives are heard and asking difficult questions and reimagining our past. And I, I could go on and on, but it just really cut really, really close to the bone um, these past few days, just thinking about that entire tradition that the that the university is just literally going to cull um, by uh, you know by um, stopping the teaching of of Gaelic of French Spanish German, but it's not just about languages, is it? It's about the entire modes of thinking and ways of um, ways of challenging different uh, dominant narratives um, through all of these methodologies that you presented today that I think are just so important. So that just resonated really, really closely with everybody, I think, on this call. So I'm going to um, pass it over to Joseph to, to run the Q&A and just say, Rene, how just um, what a wonderful way to round off um, our seminar sessions for, for this um, semester. And just thank you so much for, for everything that you've given us today. Thank you so much, Eve. You've been really helpful during this process. So thank you so much for working with me on this. Take care. Thanks so much. If I could come in there, Rene, thank you so much. That that was amazing um, and so rich. And just it's been fantastic to see the kind of work that you've been doing um, as part of the the ILCS uh, practice fellowship as well. Um, so that's really, really, really amazing. Um, I can imagine there's actually quite a lot of questions. And I know some came through the chat earlier on. So I, I might just go back through and try and pick some of those up but in the meantime if people did want to ask a question live then please feel free to raise your 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 actual hand or your digital hand and unmute yourselves you should be able to do that um just to remind you that the q a is recorded um so your question will be recorded if you don't want to be recorded then you can pop your question in the chat and i'll happily um read it out for renee Thank you. Right. So um, I'm just looking through the chat. I can see there's a question um, from Safia and Renee. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm a PhD student and career poet. Uh, my work is dedicated to exploring new ways in writing the Black dancing body through embodied methods of research, focusing specifically on the Anglo Anglo-Caribbean. Question, how did you work through the challenges of presenting the abstract, the space which eludes language in both your writing and art? Wow, thank you so much for that question. And your research sounds really fascinating. We must connect. I hope you do so. I found it very challenging um, to get to this point. Um, as I started off in my talk by saying is that academia can, there are so many boundaries in academia and there are, uh, academia likes to fit people into brackets of theory, brackets of practice that doesn't enable us to be our whole selves as researchers. I found that doing writing my PhD that I had to give up art and give up music. And so doing this project was, as I said, a, a kind of rebelling against the academy in, in that way. But more to your question about presenting the abstract, uh, the space which eludes language in both uh, my writing and art. I 
I have come across several challenges. I am actually working on a, uh, a, a um, an essay, a, a kind of multi-sensory essay at the moment, which is gonna be published as part of an, a, an edited collection. And within that essay, it obviously is a written essay, but there are elements where that are auditory that you can click and hear. And I am <laughs> quite painfully and shyly speaking in or reiterating poems in Jamaican Patwa. Now that was a challenge for me as a, as a third generation uh, British Jamaican, specifically because of what I'm often told is with kind of the hyphens of my identity being black British and Caribbean, black referring to Africa, but not being very disconnected from Africa, uh, British, but yet being in Britain, white people will often kind of exclude us from what it truly means to be British. And then finally, Caribbean, having never actually been born in the Caribbean, the hyphens have left the, these questions in my mind about really and truly who I am. So engaging in the abstract in the space that eludes language has been, it has been a very self-reflexive experience, very difficult because I've had to engage with parts of myself that I truly even now don't even know or understand because I'm so removed. But it's it's having these questions and I often say, I'm uh, philosophically minded, I would say, where I believe that questions are more important than answers. I believe that understanding what questions to ask is so much more difficult than even you know finding the answers to say. And I have found that th that has been the greatest challenge in presenting the abstract in uh, that kind of eluding language in both my writing and my art. It is finding the right questions and how, how I can perceptively um, present those questions through writing and through art, through music and in, in those certain types of ways. So thank you for that question. I hope that that answers, answers that. And please um, do connect with me after. I'd be interested to hear more about your work. That's great. Thanks so much, Renee, and thank you for your question. Um, I'm conscious there's a hand up in the room, so I'll go to, is it Alfrina next? Yes, it's Alfrina, but you can call me Jamie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. Lando. Uh, thank you for your great and very informative presentation. As you were talking about rape stories and stereotypes, um, I thought of uh, Nobesi Phillips' poem, This Place, The Space Between, uh, where she patently, blatantly engages in debunking myths about yeah. African female Blackness. And I wanted to know, what are your thoughts on literary works which don't just subtly deal with these stereotypes, but actually patently, you know, engage with and, de and, and deconstruct them. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you me. so much, Alfrina. Thank you. I'm excited by this question because um, Marlon James is one of my favorite Caribbean writers for that reason. In his novel, uh, The Book of Night Women, it is written, I would definitely recommend that everybody if you're interested in these kind of histories to buy that book. It's the neo-slave narrative. However, I would say that it is largely written in a kind of orthography of um, that Jamaican Pat was. So for some who, who aren't accustomed to the language, it may be difficult. But in his text, he really, um, really draws on the kind of Jezebel stereotype, the hypersexualization of the black woman and thinking about the histories, the, the sexually violent histories of enslaved black women. And he does so in such a violent and explicit way, which has garnered much criticism uh, for you know obvious reason, it's very explicit. Um, but I would say, and I, I would agree with Marlon James here, and he this is one thing that he kind of argues against that point, is that violence needs to be violent. Um, and that may be controversial to say, but oftentimes, and, and Britain is the best example, Britain has very much sanitized, glamorized its history to the point where we kind of, you know, suddenly know, uh, in Britain, we suddenly know that there was an invo there was involvement uh, of Britons in, in the Caribbean towards slavery, but we do not know the extent. Britain has figured itself on the global stage as the hero of slavery for being the first to abolish slavery, even though they garnered and engineered some of the most horrific um, acts of uh, the institution of slavery in the Caribbean. And there is this thing where, you know, 
slavery in America is more realized because it, it took place in America. The British were very smart and said, we're gonna have it thousands of miles away in an island where genocide has already happened. And we're gonna take these people there and we're going to enslave. And then when we come back, we are, there is this geographical distance, but there is also a, a, an educational distance because of glamorization. So Marlon James argues that violence needs to be violent. Stereotypes need to be explicit. These things need to be called out plainly. It's going to be an uncomfortable experience to read. Uh, very uncomfortable, but I argue, and I've argued so many times before, that you only change only occurs when you're uncomfortable. And that's one thing that I've noticed. Change can never happen if we're comfortable and we're just having comfortable conversations, comfortable readings, comfortable listenings, comfortable engagements. Change does not work that way. You have to be uncomfortable. And so what it takes from us as readers, as active listeners, or whatever the case may be, is to be willing to be uncomfortable. Only then can we really, and bearing the history as it is, or as it was rather, is uh, uh, giving justice to our enslaved, or rather my enslaved ancestors. They do not want, I, I imagine that they would not want their history sanitized. In order for their voice to be heard uh, in, in ways, you know, through literature, through song or whatever else, you have to realize their pain. And so I believe their stories must be told as, as it was. And that obviously includes the uh, racial stereotyping of their bodies, of their character as well. So this is a very interesting text that you've mentioned. I've not heard it before. Thank you for that recommendation. But I would, I would say that violence must be violent and, and uncomfortable. That is just my opinion and, 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 and you know, my theorization. Others may have other opinions for certain reasons because, you know, obviously there are there are times where we need, there needs to even be like trigger warnings and things like that, which I've incorporated in my work. Very, very essential because we're not trying to trigger or, or to, um, uh, uh, to re-traumatize individuals, even like myself. Doing this work has been traumatizing at times. It's been very hard because it's, it's close to home. I'm not just one of those researchers who research something that is distant from them. This is very much my history and culture. And so at times it has been a painful experience, but it has been very rewarding, I will say, in that I have not only learned so much about myself, but I can now think about my enslaved um, African ancestors and as well the non-human and natural world and how they engage with the natural world in ways that reference I can reverence them to such a level that I could not have before if I didn't know the history as it was. So thank you for that question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alfred, and, and thanks to Renee for that response. Um, there's a question from Leon in the chat, which I'm just going to read out. Um, first of all, congratulations, Dr. Landell, very well-deserved um, conferment. Um, and the question is, how can I use Caribbean literature in the way you've presented it here as a training resource for teachers in schools? Context, I'm building a research project looking at the policing and punishment of Black, specifically Caribbean young people speaking Caribbean languages within an educational setting and how that impacts their development, identity and societal security. This is done from a security studies disciplinary perspective. Thank you. Wow, first of all, <laughs> that is a uh, very, very interesting, um, very interesting work, very important work, actually, rather, should I say. Very, very important work. So thank you for your work. I would say that um, including or embedding alternative practice in, you know, not just literature, but pedagogical practice for social studies. I believe this sounds more like social studies. Correct me if I'm wrong. But in any educational setting, I think can be um, very enlightening for students in ways which, as I said, the first point being accessibility. As I said, I had somebody who was at a different level of accessibility and having multi-sensory experience in the classroom enabled there to be equity in the classroom. So that's the first thing. You're dealing with, um, you know, policing and punishment. And so I'm, I'm sure you're, you're, what you really engage with is equity and justice. So thinking about the ways that we can embed that even in our pedagogical practice, I believe even for you, can heighten, um, it can uh, really... Uh, magnify the work that you're you're trying to do in terms of the ways in which it can be presented as a resource for training um, teachers in schools. I have uh, documents and 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 thing resources that I can provide 
Um, so do leave your email. I think they're quite hard to explain here because they can be applied in various contexts to different work. But um, do feel free to connect with me and I'm happy to share all of my research, uh, my resources which talk about arts-based research and how we can apply that to pedagogical practices of all kinds. Um, so sorry I can't be more in depth with your question right now, but I'm happy to share my resources. So thank you, Leon, for that question. Thanks so much, Leon. Thanks, Renee. Um, another one from the chat. Thank you very much for your, pre uh, this is from Stephanie. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. As a master's student who is looking at perceptions of rebel identity of enslaved women in the Anglophone Caribbean, this has been amazing um, for seeing approaches to slave and neo-slave narratives that I'm now coming across in my research. My question is, when did you realise that collecting sounds would also benefit your research and strengthen your approach to eco-criticism? Side note, have you considered fire at slash crackling? Oh, wow. Well, I haven't. That's a great idea. <laughs> I am um, going to steal that with your permission. Thank you. Yes, that would be that would be great, specifically for the second painting. Um, I would say that sound for me I was writing an essay on uh, animism which you know really focused on African animism which really focused on orality as a practice and orality is essential an essential aspect of our history as African and African Caribbean people um, because it was the way to transmit ideas cultural histories um, practices and, and all sorts of things it was orality and that was uh, uh, preferred over writing in Africa. And so this is, to think about sound and think about orality, for me, was a decolonial practice where the Western world tells us that written forms and writing is superior to orality, to speech, to sound. I'm, I'm using sound as, as a decolonial practice to resist against that idea that writing is superior and anything that's you know aligned with the West is superior. And going back to our ancestral practice of hearing and transmitting through speech, through sound, prayer, poetry, all of these things were uh, cultural artifacts, cultural centerpieces to our history as African people. And so that's how sound Sound probably even came before the visual because it was so it's so embedded in our history in that way as a decolon for me as a decolonial practice but but for you know the history um, as as it relates to culture and tradition and so sound probably for me was is probably even more important than than the visual element and so that's how that came in thinking about an African animism and African eco spirituality as I said um, earlier in my research the the, the the cultural thinker who thought of the term soundscape was um, an ecologist. He was an environmentalist, thinking about how sound, soundscape, the, the term scape often refers to landscape. It, it's something that can be perceptively viewed. Um, so to think about that and to couple that with sound, always, we can always, uh, it always, sorry, evokes the environment, the landscape. And so I think sound is, is already embedded with the non-human natural world, the environment in such a way. So that's how that came in and relating to eco-criticism. And I will absolutely be considering fire crackling. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry, Thank you so much. I just drafted it and it, I, it just pressed them. So. <laughs> Oh, I didn't hear you. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. My microphone's not the best, but yeah, no, it was a draft, but I just pressed send anyway, but by accident. But yeah, no. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your question, Stephanie. Um, thanks, Renee. Um, there was one more question in the chat. If we have just a couple, of, I think we've got one or two minutes. Um, I went back through the chat and there was a question from, I hope I'm pronouncing this properly, Maya Landy. Um, and this question was, uh, dear Dr. Rene, thank you for your lovely presentation. I enjoyed a lot your discourse between your own personal and familiar history, the findings of your research and your current project. Do you think it is possible to have a multi-sensory approach in virtual workshops, mainly workshops, not lectures, um, in academic environments? Oh, absolutely. I think they would work better in workshops than in in lectures multi-sensory experiences for me is about collaboration lectures often are something where one person is is 
presenting and possibly engagement comes after. But I think with multi-sensory experience, there must be a collaboration of ideas, collaboration of um, experience with um, senses to produce something. And that's in my opinion. So workshops for me would work best in this. And that's something even I'm looking to do to, to, uh, for the future of this work is to do workshops um, in a multi-sensory approach. Again, because people have different level of abilities and engaging and understanding the world. And I find that through the various, our various senses and different, and you know, different ways of understanding, we can produce something so rich and so profound in that kind of interdisciplinary work. But I think that it, it, it would take a workshop because of the, the uh, you know, the opportunity to collaborate with others and to think with others. So I would definitely recommend if you're if you're thinking about doing that in the future, definitely go with with I'm not saying it can't work in lectures, too, but I think it would work best in workshops. So thank you so much for your your question. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for the question. And, and thanks for the reply, Renee. And um, I'm I'm sorry to have to announce that I think we are going to have to bring the session to a close because it's been such an amazing uh, presentation and, and, and multi-sensory presentation at that and discussion afterwards. I'm really, I'm really, really looking forward to uh, watching your work develop in the future, Renee. Thank you so much, Jane. And, and this, yeah, this has been, I think, just the beginning of... Um, I'm sure is going to be a really transformational space uh, to watch. So thank you so much, Renee. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you.